and record too. Okay. Give Facebook a minute or two. Let everybody know they're here. Gabe, did you have a good Easter weekend? Did have a good Easter weekend. Yeah. Amanda? Shout good folks. Easter weekend? Yeah. Yeah. Amanda's, I think, still suffering from COVID. Am I correct on that? Um, yeah, unfortunately. The rebound. The rebound. You got it finally after all your things? Yep. It's a bummer. Huge bummer. You fought the good fight. I'm still not. Still, everybody in the house still clean. No COVID over here. Wow. I, still wear my mask. I go to the market. I still wear my mask. Yep. I go pick up my takeout. I had it. I had it, but I had a such a mild. But this is the weird thing. I had a such a mild case, but literally last week before I went to Chicago, I lost my sense of smell, like completely lost it. So I was like, okay, I must have COVID again. Tested, 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 nothing. But lost my sense of smell for like a week. It was the weirdest thing. It's probably like a long COVID thing or some weird thing like that. We yeah. don't, uh, cause yeah. I was at my dentist the other day and he's like, uh, have you had COVID or I forget what he, he, I saw my mask and I was like, no, I haven't had it. You had it. There's Tom Benton, my nemesis. <laughs> hot. I, knew, I told you. Coming in hot without COVID. Hot no COVID. without COVID. We said his name three times. We did say, we conjured him. We conjured you, Tom, because it was just, it was just us. We said Tom Benton, Tom Benton, Tom Benton. So we called, we conjured My dream him. is fulfilled. I am someone's nemesis. So I am, uh, thank, thank I you, am, Dave. Going to scratch my last book off, my fourth book off my list. <laughs> I think you'll have to prepare just in case I had to fly you, solo. You, but weren't you already a fictional nemesis in that in the uh which book was it? Tom was. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah, you're right. But in real life. But we said your name, so we did conjure you. We said your name. So that was where <laughs> I was going to my story about Susanna Hoffs. Gabe, because we were talking about Susanna Hoffs was at the store on Friday, the lead singer of the Bengals. She's I love awesome. those pictures, yeah. I love her. She's just, she, and I, okay, Jay Roach was her, is her husband. They've been married for, she's <laughs> awesome. I mean, they were just like, <laughs> came in the store. So I was telling Amanda, because the lighting in our store, because I mean, down lighting's terrible anyways. He readjusted every light. He really was like, room. Oh yeah, relit the room. Like Jay Roach relit, like <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. It's so great. So you know, Julie, I'll put him back after you know, after the event was over. It's like nine, nine thirty at night. He goes, I'll put the lights back, you know. And I was just like, No, 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 we're leaving Jay Roach lighting. Yeah, and it's said, probably better. <laughs> Who knows better? He's you know. I said, We're leaving Jay Roach lighting. And I said, and I guarantee you that no one will notice. I said, it will be, I will text you in two years when somebody finally says. Right. Hey, wasn't that light? <laughs> but you can you can say lighting by a Hollywood director, lighting, lighting by, by Jay Roach. Jay Roach. Um, but back to the conjuring. So I guess Susanna Huff's back in the 80s, she would tap the the <laughs> when she would get on a plane, she would tap the the as she was walking on, she would tap the the plane like three times. That was kind of her thing. Uh, before she was just like a, and my daughter does it she taps the heart on the southwest like she always taps the heart when she oh, says I, I might have to start doing this it sounds like a good yeah. so she's been doing it since the 80s so i guess she was at this hollywood party sorry everybody we'll get to tea time in a second but i thought this was kind of a this was, oh, this was a, tea time is live oh okay. yeah we're live we're being recorded but i thought this was a really fun story so she um so she was at a Hollywood party. This was a few years ago when girls was really big and the whole bit. And there was, she saw these, the, she's um, Lena Dunham and all the girls that were there. They were like, should we tell her? Should we tell her? So I guess they do the same thing. They tap the plane three times, but they say her name three times. So they conjure her every time. Susanna Hobbs, Susanna Hobbs, Susanna Hobbs. Oh. <laughs> So we're going to start doing that with you, Tom, Tom Benton, Tom Benton, Tom Benton. That's pretty good. <laughs> well, thank you for conjuring me. I was wondering, I was like, should I? Should I not? Oh, I have to. I have to. I'm drawn. You, must have, you felt the pull. You pulled yeah. you. You felt pulled the you pull. In. All My right. Bad. All right. It's going to go Gabe, um, Tom, Amanda. I'm saying, I'm assuming you're staying on. I'm going to chat about some books. Good. Okay. Perfect. And I, um, I, I guess I would talk about one, but it's, it's, it's Steve. So I'll wait till Steve's on here and talk about it. So I think you're able to share Gabe, so you I can, will, so you can think, head on to the share. I think I closed this thing. Why isn't it up there? Sorry. Uh, okay. 
So I do crowdcast and then I do this are confusing because they're different. So no excuses. I've been no, doing three years enough. in, Gabe, three years in. I've been doing this long enough. <laughs> no excuses. No excuses. Um, so spy books are all of a sudden, spy series are all of a sudden, um, all the rage, they're back. Yep. Um, I remember years ago, I had a really Jones for like a good Cold War spy. And I remember bringing it up to editorial and marketing and they're like, yeah, that's Cold War is dead. And there's not a, you know, the 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 spy stuff now is a little different. So then there wasn't much, but all of a sudden we're seeing some good stuff. Uh, we are at Harper, are repackaging. Uh, and we are now, we haven't been, they've been at random, I think, uh, house. But now uh, we are now the publishers of the original Ian Fleming, James Bond books. Or not so original. Some of the offensive stuff has been cleaned up a little bit in the new editions, apparently. <laughs> but we are the official uh, uh, family trust entrusted publisher of the Ian Fleming books. And then Kim Misherwood, who is a, uh, a you not a, not been long on the literary scene. This is her second book. First book was published by a small press. Um, and this book is generating a lot of attention. So double or nothing. James Bond has gone missing. Um, it is contemporary in setting, and what? Uh, and we meet the new team of Double O's. So Joanna, who's Double O three, and Dryden, who's Double O four, and Bashir, who's they all. So all the new, the new Double O assassins, and they're all on the lookout, uh, trying to you know find Bond. And uh, is he dead? Has he been killed by a nefarious a nemesis? Um, has he been captured? Is he dead? Uh, and then another backstory is this fellow who is a scientist who is claiming that he can reverse climate change, which gives him a certain a level of power. Um, but time is running out for Bond. Time is running out for the planet. There's a lot of ticking clocks here. And uh, it's a really interesting um, take on Bond. I read the Bond books when I was a little kid. I was probably 12, 13 when I read the Bond books. And I was like... <laughs> Uh, giggly because they were a little, <laughs> nah, you know, Ooh, they were a little, they're a little spicy. Little, yeah, they were a little spicy for the names of the characters. Even I'd be just like, um, but I, I just, I ate, I ran through them on. I, I don't want to reread them because I'm afraid they're not going to be as good as I remember. Um, and honestly, there have been a number as opposed to like Sherlock Holmes pastiches. There's millions of them. They tend to do fairly well. The the Bond stuff hasn't really taken off uh, particularly well, but I think this book is so different um, that it really stands on its own, and it's a whole new look at the whole Bond, and because there's no Bond in here really, um, uh, so uh, she to sort of takes the uh, um, the franchise to a new place or updates it a little bit, and I, which I think she I just thought it was pretty brilliant, uh, really engaging read really fast paced, really good cast of characters. And the reviews have been really good. The reviewers have been really um, uh, nice to this book. So here and abroad. So we're excited, something fun. That's a big deal having the Ian Fleming stuff. I mean, that's that's huge. Having that back. And, and did they, I missed, did you say, I mean, have they, I know because for a while, long ago, Putnam did new James Bond novels, but then it's, has it been a long time since there's been a new, you know the uh, Horowitz, Anthony Horowitz has done a couple oh, of that's right. pastiches, and um, there's something every once in a while floats out there. Right, uh, but they're Sorry. tough. To, they've been they've been a little tough. I forgot about Horowitz. Really. Yeah. All righty, Tom. What do you got? I have "There Will Be Fire," subtitle: Ooh. Margaret Thatcher, the IRA, and two minutes that changed history. <clears throat> so this is just out tomorrow. Uh, will be out tomorrow, or no, I think it was out last Tuesday, um, in hardcover, um, and it's a really, it's a race against the clock, it's a true story, so this is, uh, it was October 12th, 1984, that uh, the IRA exploded a bomb in Brighton, England, where Margaret Thatcher and a lot of the conservative, or conservative it was like a conservative gathering of the conservative party at the Grand Hotel in Brighton, and it was a it was an assassination attempt on Margaret Thatcher, and just by randomness, <clears throat> she did not she did not die. But it was uh, you know so the book itself is like a a TikTok thriller, like <clears throat> how we got how you know how the this is the assassin, how he got you know how he was chosen, 
how he got to the hotel, you know, minute, almost minute by minute. Um, and then, but he also is able to tell a larger story of what that bombing has meant to Ireland and to the UK, even up to uh, Brexit. So there are, there are things that have happened since then, obviously, the Irish Accords um, that, that, that resonate today. Um, but it's a really um, taught, it's like, it, it's terrible, but it reads like a thriller. Like that's a cliche, but it totally reads like a thriller. It's, um, it's like it, Day of the Jackal. Remember, we all remember mm -hmm. hopefully mm -hmm. Frederick Forsyth's Day of the Jackal. It is totally a real life Day of the Jackal. Brilliantly reported and written. He's a great writer. He's the Irish course, Ireland correspondent for The Guardian. Um, so if you liked, like I love Patrick Redden Keeps Say Nothing, one of my favorite nonfiction books of the last 10 years. Um, I you know, you'll devour this because I, I love Say Nothing so much. And I was waiting for, I'm waiting for something else like it. This is that book. Um, so, or if you're interested in true, true crime, um, Irish history, any of those things, you're going to be interested in. There will be fire. In England, it's called simply uh, Killing Thatcher. But I think maybe because of the uh, Bill O'Reilly books, maybe we don't want to call it Killing Thatcher here. <laughs> maybe other reasons. But, Could be um, other reasons. There will be fire by um, Rory Carroll. I love Ooh, it. That sounds fascinating. Oh, I know it oh, sounds yeah. so good. I bet it would be a good audio book too. Oh, I bet you're right. I haven't listened to it, but I'm sure yeah. you're right. I bet the yeah. audio book would be so good. Ooh, well, and that's funny you say that because I listened to Say Nothing on audio and it was fantastic. Yeah. So, so this one sounds right. like it would just be one of those that would just like make your pace of walking faster. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and there and there is with everything with this story of the of Ireland and the troubles. Um, you know, there's so much uh, ambiguity about who's good, who's bad, um, and he he covers all all aspects of that. Depends on which side of that fence argument you're on. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so the one that you talked about, I can't remember whether it was last week or the week before. You talked about um, a fever in the heartland. Yeah, last the Timothy, week. the Timothy <laughs> Egan. Book. Yeah, so he's I follow. Um, She's a government teacher, I think, but she's like super popular now. She's got this podcast and I follow her on Twitter and everything. Sharon says so. Mm. And he's on her podcast today talking about that book. So if y'all are interested in finding oh. out more about that book, go to Sharon says so. Um, I just Googled her and her podcast comes up and it's Timothy Egan's on there today. Oh, cool. So Either. That would be interesting for yeah, sure. Yeah, super interesting. I might have to go back and listen to that one. Okay, Amanda, what do you have for us? Uh, this is out tomorrow. It's called Once Upon a Prime, The Wondrous Connections Between Mathematics and Literature. And uh, this is a book for fans of um, Seven Brief Lessons on Physics, if you enjoyed that one. And the author, this is really cool. Um, she is the <laughs> first woman to hold England's oldest mathematical chair. So it's a position that has, has this unbroken lineage since 1597. And she's the 33rd Gresham professor of geometry and the first woman to hold the seat. Um, and so, this is uh, a book that talks about the math you find in popular literature, like James Joyce. Um, did you know that Moby Dick is full of sophisticated geometry? Did you know that George Eliot was obsessed with statistics? Uh, so it's if you're a person who in, enjoys math and also enjoys great literature, this is a book for you. It's from Flat Iron, and it comes out tomorrow. It's by Sarah Hart. Once what a great, a, great idea. I don't love math. I, I hate love literature, but I kind of love the idea of where does, how does math, what role does it play in literature? I'm not good at math, but I, um, I am interested in reading about it from people who are able to eloquently. Yes, I agree. Talk about math in a way that makes me feel smart. So this is one of those books. Well, and that's the thing too, is that, I mean, that's why, that's why I'm in books. Cause I was not very good at math. <laughs> I have the same origin story. <laughs> it's still, it's just like, we're on that boat. I know it's so funny because I live with my husband is like, was like summa cum laude, like 
computer programmer, like Uber math guy. I mean, like he could just do like weird shit in his brain. And my, my one daughter definitely um, got that gene too. And they just look at me like, I mean, I have to get a calculator out to do like simple subtra- subtraction. And they're just like, what is wrong with you? I pull out a pen and start doing, you know, writing down the problem. And- yeah, yeah. It's just, I just don't have, and and my one daughter gets really mad at me because she goes like, yes, you can, you just refuse to. And it's just like, whatever, <laughs> whatever, whatever. <laughs> I got I got shamed in college. I, I took like, I mean, my kids laughed because I went back to finish school and I needed, and they added like a math thing that I had postponed because I took a philosophy class that was, way more complex than any math class I would have taken. Uh, so I really screwed myself. And then because I took so many years to graduate, I had to qualify against the new catalog. So I had to take this math that I did not qualify for. So I took the one before it and the, and the second one before it. And then I took the class and I remember throwing a little tantrum in front of my prof because I just didn't get it. And he goes, you know what? If you do the homework and you study, you'll understand what's going on. You see me at office hours. So he was like, he totally shamed me. And it was like, Ouch. yeah, uh, I got to be in the class. There you go. I got to yeah. be in the class. But I, he, just, I was like, you know, he just like whipped me in front of the class. I was like, oh. I know. And they, so they say just this sort of thing. Okay, that's like, yeah. But it's, uh, you know, ask, I, where, what goes where? I, you know, it's like, how do you, a linear equation? I know what a linear equation is. I can talk about it, but I like, how do you set it up? And I couldn't even tell you. Yep. An excellent but that book, that book does, does sound really good. But I, let me, I think let me really read one more line from the, the description. Professor Hart shows how math and literature are complementary parts of the same quest to understand human life and our place in the universe. Well, that's what they say. Math's everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah. All right. Okay, Gabe, save us from math. Save us from math, Gabe. What's next? (laughs) Enough math talk. Enough of that. That's not why they tune in. (laughs) (laughs) They will read that book, though. They tune in for stuff like this. So, uh, Kidnapped West by Milan Kundera. These are actually essays that were published a long time ago. Uh, And um, we just pulled them out. We're going to make some money. Um, (laughs) No, we don't just pull stuff out crazily like that. The, these are important essays. It's a small book, uh, it, but it's important essays on the state of Europe, uh, particularly in light of Russia's invasion of um, of um, uh, Ukraine. <laughs> Ukraine. Sorry, um, I got Kiev in my. I don't know why I've got Kiev in my head today for some reason. Oh. But uh, there's a lot of Kiev this week on TV or something. Anyways. Um, yeah, so uh, in, in the shadow of, of what is what Russia is doing again is in, in attacking Europe, um, we harken back to some of these early writings by Milan Kundera from the 60s and uh, looking at um, uh, the Prague Spring, you know, in, in, his, in, in his home country, looking at um, the many incursions of Russia into the West, and then they've pulled back um, but now he's, you know, they seem to be on that uh, mode of getting the band back together again. Putin wants to, seems like he wants to get the Soviet Union together again. And uh, he's made some bold moves. You know, he took Crimea without a, without too much problems. Belarus is in his hip pocket and um, everything that's gone on. And now we have Ukraine. So these are kind of haunting in that they they speak very much to the situation of the threat of Russia uh, coming into the West and the smaller countries being uh, eaten up and colonized and the European culture, uh, which is under attack by some folks because it's changing. Um, um, there's some concerns about that. So there's an 83, a 1983 essay that was translated by Edmund White in here, um, which was all about the Prague Spring. Um, and uh, a look at what what was going on with a lot of the small nations that were impacted back then. So really interesting reading. Uh, like I said, really short pieces that will stick to somebody who wants to, uh, you know, see M- Milan's thoughts on on war and on Russia uh, as an existential threat to Europe and European culture. Okay, so did you watch the? Um, I think it's on Netflix about the missing Singapore flight. Did you did you watch that documentary? Yeah. 
okay, so about Crimea, there was that whole conspiracy that the missing Singapore flight took over the news, like, because um, it happened at the same time, took over the news. Uh, I'm going to just destroy this story because oh, I'm news, a terrible the, story. the news cycle? The news cycle. Because when, but that was when Russia went in to grab Crimea. Right. And so it took that completely off the news cycle. So there's this whole conspiracy theory that it was Russia that took down the, the, um, the. But then a few weeks later, they shot, was it in, over Belarus, they shot on another. But it was before that. They shot the thing, well, they shot it down before yeah. it. You're so right there's this whole the... thing that that missing Singapore flight was Russia who did it. We can get into all kinds of conspiracy theories. Wow, from math to to math to conspiracy. conspiracy. Theories. I, not, that I'm a, has it all. not that I'm a conspiracy theorist weirdo, but I. Yeah, but what happened to that plane? plane? You know what happened to that? There's what happened no to that plane? No what happened to that plane? And the fact that it took it because it's it's been a year now since and that for Ukraine and that absorb. I mean, that was just like all over the. I mean, it it would never let it go. There was nothing else that took it out of the out of the news cycle. The whole Ukraine thing. So I'm wondering if. Crimea would have had as much exposure if that would have been the same outcome. Who knows? Going skeptical. Just a little skeptical. skeptical. Just a little skeptic on that stuff. So anyways, maybe he wouldn't have had it so easy taking Crimea. Anyways, Tom. How did we do there again? Oh, right. (laughs) Milan Kundera. Yeah, Milan. Uh, He was talking about... So new in paperback from us, from Riverhead, is The Return of Faraz Ali. That's out tomorrow, I think, in paper. So this was a book that, you know, as we know, <laughs> I mean, we've, we've talked about it before on Tea Time. Some books get great reviews and they just don't break through the way you hope they will. And this is one of those books that hopefully in paperback, more discussion, more discovery of. It's, it's a great first novel. Um, so Faraz Ali, so it's set in um, Lahore, Pakistan. Uh, Faraz Ali grew up there in the red light district. Um, and then his, fa- his powerful father, you know, uh, actually kidnapped him from the red light district. So now he's an adult. He's a police police officer. And he's sent back to Lahore, to the walled city, to basically his, he's told to, um, there's been a, a murder of a child prostitute, and he's sent to cover up the crime. So this brings up all of his past, um, and it's a really rich uh, novel that's driven by crime. So it's kind of a page turner at the same time, but you're learning a lot about the setting and the the time and the place. Um, Really great first novel, got incredible reviews. So this is for readers of uh, Viet Thanh Nguyen, um, Mohsen Hamid, uh, any any of the writers like that. Um, It's, uh, so it was a front page New York Times book review when we published it in hardcover a year ago. Um, it's a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize for First Fiction. Um, so that's The Return of Faraz Ali. Find it in paperback. It's um, the review, the, the front page New York Times review called it quietly stunning. Stunning not only on account of the writer's talent, of which there's clearly plenty, but also in its humanity and how a book this unflinching in its depiction of class and institutional injustice can still feel so tender. So needs to be discovered. It does. I, I, are we comparing him to Halad Hosseini at all? I mean, it's just, it's like. Oh yeah, there's that. a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and it's a, it's a woman. She, the author is a woman. She, right. But I mean, the story, the story. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I think that's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think in the same way that like. Discoverability, it's like, that's yeah. that's where, because like he was, he was a debut author at one point too. Right, and, you, and, the, and the reason at the time we wanted to know more about Afghanistan. So you're right, that is, that is a good comparison because yeah. that's why we read books like this to understand this other culture that we have no connection that to. That we have no connection to and that it's a well done and Riverhead does a great job. Riverhead was Halad Husseini too, exactly. right? Exactly, you're right, yeah. Yeah. That's great. yeah. And, and Mohsen Hamid also. Mohsen Hamid, yeah. And so it's just like this, we need to, we need to pay attention to these books because they're, yeah. yeah. Because they're going to tell us something that, and it sounds like it's like, like I said, with Helen's book, it's um, the book club books that are like the good ones for discussion. For they sure. stick around. They stick around the good ones. Yeah, exactly. All right, Amanda, what do you got? Really quick. Um, I, I went to a virtual 
party sort of thing uh, with the author of that book. And she was talking about how people were saying, or it's kind of a, a noir book with heart. So we, we were we were saying, oh, we should we should coin a new phrase, a new a new name for that genre. <laughs> Cour noir, heart noir. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, seems really cool. The author. Yeah. Oh, really? I'm yeah. gonna. She'll, she's gonna be at the LA Times Festival of Books, so I hope oh, to cool. catch up with her there. When is that? Is that this coming weekend? Not this weekend, but the following. Okay. Okay. After two and a half years, uh, this book is now in paperback. It's The Invisible Life of Annie LaRue. This is like one of my <laughs> quarantine books, I guess, because I've been talking about it since the beginning of Tea Time, like the inception of Tea Time. Uh, so this is a book for people who, uh, let's see, enjoy uh, Alex Harrow or Aaron Morgenstern or Naomi Novik. Mm -hmm. And it's a fairy tale retelling. And basically, as with a lot of fairy tales about magic, um, if you're not careful when you wish, you might get screwed. And so our main character, uh, she makes a sort of wish with, a, with a, an entity in the 1700s and gains a sort of immortality. But along with her immortality, whenever she meets people, um, they immediately forget her. Like they just blank out and it's as if she, she wasn't there. So uh, the story reaches to modern day where uh, Addie meets a, a handsome bookseller in New York and he somehow remembers her. So uh, yeah, it's her story and uh, her struggle with this entity that she made the wish with. And it's just super enchanting and wonderful. And that's why it's taken two and a half years to come into hardcover or out of hardcover because there was really no need. <laughs> so Exactly. Yeah. So, like, but here it is now. It's uh, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. That's going to explode in paperback. Yep. I think so. Yeah. There was a special edition hardcover with, with some art and like a ribbon and yeah, it's, it's okay. But like, uh, yeah, I, I hope it enjoys a, a, you know, a long life with new legs and I'm interested to see what comes next from B.E. Schwab. She's very, very gifted. Yep. All right. I think we're going to lightning. Right? We're, we're speeding through today, everybody. <laughs> lightning. Lightning. Standing in the Shadows by Peter Robinson, uh, the late Peter Robinson, who just passed away late last year. Uh, this is the 28th twisting installment in the DCI Alan Banks series, which is one of the best series out there. Um, I, I, like I said, I say every time I present a Peter Robinson book, there was one book that was not the strongest of the bunch, but for a guy who does a book a year, um, He's a pretty good writer. He's my sister's like one of her all time favorites. I had Peter send her a signed galley one time and she like freaked out when she got it. And, uh, it's, uh, she can't wait for the next one. She devoured the series. Um, he's a really sweet guy. I worked a lot with Peter, uh, but I because I really like his mysteries. He, the Alan Banks character, he's evolved that character. He's evolved the people around him. He um, creates these really fun mysteries. And uh, this one st st stood out to me. It reminded me the most of like the very first Peter Robinson book I read was, uh, which was In a Dry Season. Uh, and what I loved about In a Dry Season is that the, 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 there were two plots of the parallel plots. Uh, they were quite parallel plots, but there was a mystery from the 40s uh, during the war years that uh, tumbled over into a mystery in the uh, late 90s uh, when he wrote or shoot yeah when he wrote that when he wrote that book uh you know dry season in 97 uh and this book also has two really good strong plots um first one starts in 1980 uh nick comes home to his hometown uh to his old house and um he uh comes back from a university lecture and his house is crawling with police um, because his ex-girlfriend has been killed and um, he is obviously a prime suspect, uh, but also her current boyfriend has gone missing. 
Um, Nick becomes a suspect, but the trail goes cold. Everything's forgotten. And then we move into 2019 and there's a young archaeologist working a site and she stumbles upon a skeleton that is not um, as old as it's supposed to be for the site that she's digging in. Um, so the crime comes to the surface and Alan Banks is called in and he just does a terrific job of weaving these two stories together, um, seemingly unrelated and does such a good job. Um, but in everything, you know, really good writing, really good, strong mystery. They're more procedurals, um, but uh, always a strong mystery. And, you know, uh, the character Alan Banks, a little Spencer-ish. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, sometimes he overlooks a few things because for, for the greater good. So he's got his own moral compass and all those cliches that go with the, uh, the, the not so lone detective because he's got a good team around him, but uh, just a lot of fun. Always a lot of fun to read Peter Robinson. Yeah. And I love that he got, that he signed a galley to your sister. It's so funny how people, I mean, I still get excited about that stuff, but especially when it's like, you, you do that for a family member or something. It's, yeah. it's really fun. That's the best, really, yeah. It really is, because it's like, there's something super exciting about that. Okay, Tom? Okay. So my last book is another paperback that's coming out, I think, tomorrow. Life on the Rocks by Julie Barrowald. So this is, and this is also a nominee for the LA Times Book Prize. This is in the science category. So it's about the coral reef. So she's a, she's a scientist and a, and a really good science writer. So it's about the loss of the coral reefs, the beauty of the coral reefs. The, so she goes around the world, talks to scientists, activists who are trying to come up with some solution in order to somehow, you know, they're in emergency. They're, it's an emergency right now. And so she's traveling the world, talking to all of the experts to, to sort of uh, give us an idea whether there is hope. And, and that's what's so good. That's what's nice about the book. She also braids in it her own um, personal story with her daughter who ha is struggling with um, anxiety and things like that. And <laughs> somehow through the two stories, she's, it's, it ends up being hopeful. Somehow you feel a little bit of hope that the coral reefs, uh, we might find a way to save them um, and restore them, basically. So she, she goes to Florida, Australia, Indonesia, Bali, all these places and talks to the experts. Um, you know, it's a, it's a bleak story, but uh, you do, you, she does end it with a little bit of hope. Um, though the though though it's going to be like a, a lifelong it's going to be not a slope it's going to take a while it is going to take a while but um, really good science book life on the rocks yeah it's really depressing when you see what coral reefs yeah looked like and what they look like now I mean it's it's devastating right we don't have much time no I mean how do you kill a, an organism like that that's like you know like a right. rock basically and yeah we kill it. You know? Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> we kill a rock. We killed it. <laughs> what seemed impossible, we we took care we did. of. We 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 were able to do. But I mean, like especially, I think I can't remember what I was watching. So I think it was somewhere in Australia. But I mean, these beautiful, colorful, and they're just like yeah, bleached, drained of white. all yeah. yes color, and white and out. gray, and just like they're dead. And it's just yeah. yeah. It's a it's a generational commitment that has to happen for it right. to um, for it to. And change. the inspiring part for the, in the book comes from the people who have dev are devoting their lives to trying to solve the problem or yeah. come up with solutions. Which I think was there a sixty minutes on this too? I think I've seen. I think so. Where these you, they've shown people who are working to do this. I've yeah. seen because they've shown the regeneration. I've seen things yeah. that are that have yeah. regenerated, like part of. And I don't know what, like I said, it might have been six minutes, right, or something, but that that have regenerated part of of, of a right. roof, but yeah. not at the extent that it needs to be. No, not even close. All right, Amanda. On that happy note, what are you <laughs> going to close us out with? <laughs> Wanted to mention. Stash, oh, yeah. My Life in Hiding by Laura Cathcart Robbins. Uh, she will be at Warwick's this week. This is an addiction memoir, um, so it's not necessarily super fun, but it's very well written, very engagingly written. Um, she, yeah, it's her story of her addiction and going through her divorce and 
going through recovery and with withdrawal and um she's a she's the host of a podcast called the only one in the room uh and she is a ted speaker and uh, a winner of multiple uh, like she she's a la moth story slam winner um and she's uh, on the advisory board of the san diego writers festival so she's a she's a tip-top storyteller and I think it's going to be a really good event. So if you, so yeah, if you happen to uh, want to get some really good memoir in your life, this is Stash. It's good. Great cover too. It's a really good cover. And she's yeah. awesome. She's like so personal. So to see what her story was and who she is now, it's like reconciling the two. It's just like, she's just like on it. And so it's really, it's really a good story. Okay, well, Amanda told you about that. We've got so many good events coming up, everybody. It's like, if you're in San Diego, I can't even describe what we got going on. Come see Admiral McRaven next week. We got Andrew McCarthy. Yes, the 80s Andrew McCarthy coming in May. Um, Abraham Verghese is coming. Um, Isabel Yende. It, was just, it is just chock-a-block. The pandemic's over. <laughs> <laughs> Warwick's declares. Forget what Joe Biden says. Warwick's, Warwick's is declared. <laughs> Come out and see us. We got so many good events lined up and they're all in person and it's going to be really fun. So with that, happy reading, everybody. We got lots of good books again this week and um, check out the website for the events and we'll see you all next week. Bye.